We uh, we'll get to see how quick Micah and Chad's fingers are this morning. Uh, I I hear some other people coughing, um, and I'm going to try not to do that the whole time I speak. Um, Amanda made me get the box of Kleenex to bring with me um, up here, so hopefully we can do that, and you won't have to hear that either. So you guys be ready, um, because it could happen any time. Um, as we sang this morning, and we sang Amazing Grace, the, the, the words to one of the verses was, He will my shield and portion be. Um, and that's kind of where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, it's, it's so good to, to sing these songs, and, and, and you're familiar with them, and, and they, they, they get inside of your, your mind and in your heart, and... and uh, just like God's Word, and, and you're able to, to sing these, and, and God will bring them to our minds a lot of times. But um, as we were singing that, my, my mind latched on to, He will my shield and portion be. Um, and, and if we think about the, the shield and, and how it defends, um, and then also think about the, the word portion, and um, you know, when you, you cut cake, I, I like my portion to be big, and it's nice, and it's, it's the good, you know. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, when we look in Genesis 39, um, last week we kind of took this short detour and, and we talked about Judah. And this week we're, you know, you just flip the page in your Bible and now we're back to the story of Joseph. I'm going to move this because I'm going to trip over it. But uh, we're back to the story of, of Joseph and the last time we saw Joseph, he, he was being carried off by a caravan uh, of Ishmaelites or, or Midianites, and his brothers had sold him into slavery, and they go and lie to their, their father and say, he's dead. Um, and we see that as the caravan carries him off, we, we find out that he's sold to uh, this guy named Potiphar that lives in Egypt. And, and so... In, in Genesis 39, we're going to find out a little bit more about who this Potiphar guy is um, and the significance of that. Uh, but one of the first things that I want you to notice in Genesis 39 is this phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. And for the past few weeks, there's really been no mention of God. Um, when we talked about uh, what happened with Dinah in Shechem, uh, when we talked about uh, Joseph being sold into slavery, when we talked about Judah uh, last week, there has been no mention of God being on the scenes. And a few weeks ago, we talked about how God was working behind the scenes, even when Scripture doesn't say that He is there. Um, that God was very present with Joseph and that He was still active in his life. And what we find today is that not only is God with Joseph, but Joseph takes notice that God is with him. Uh, it, it doesn't explicitly say that in the text, but we do see that, that Joseph's reactions and what he says points to God. Um, Joseph doesn't know what God is doing, but he know, does know that, that God is doing something, that God is there, that He is active. And, and last week, we saw that Judah, uh, it, the Scripture says, turned away. From his brothers, he turned away from the God of his family. Um, but this week, we will find that that Joseph turns towards God, and again, it's it's seen in his words and it's seen in his response to temptation. Many of you are probably familiar with this passage of scripture, and, and we talk about the temptation of Joseph, and we see that with with Potiphar's wife. But also in this narrative, there are two other minor temptations uh, that we can kind of overlook, uh, but they really bookend the chapter. And so this morning, that's what we want to look at is, is all three of these. And so we want to look at the temptation of authority, uh, the temptation of sensuality, or, or that sexual temptation that uh, many of us would be familiar with in this story and then also the, the temptation of bitterness. And so, 
As we start to read, we'll, we'll pick up in Genesis 39 and verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. I skipped a section. Sorry. Here we go. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him an overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all he had in house and field. Now, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. And so this first temptation is the temptation of authority, and it's really subtle um, if we don't take time to think about where Joseph is at uh, and who he is. And we find out in the story that he is serving Potiphar, and Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh. He is the captain of the guard, so this is not someone that is just the head of a, a security team. Uh, being the head of Pharaoh's guard meant that he was like this commander, this general uh, of an army. And, and this is one of the most powerful civilizations at, at this time. And so here we have Joseph who is serving under this general. He was sold as a slave to Potiphar. And it says that everything that Joseph does succeeds. God blesses Joseph because of his service, and Potiphar notices this, and so he appoints him to oversee his household. And so here is the temptation, and again, it's very subtle. Joseph is now appointed to a very powerful position. All that Potiphar owns is under Joseph's command. Potiphar's only concern is the food that he eats. And so, Potiphar, the the roof is leaking. It's all right. Joseph will take care of that. Potiphar, you've got a meeting scheduled today with this diplomat. Okay? Send send Joseph to that. I'm I'm too busy. Potiphar, we're we're going into battle, and we've got to come up with this strategy uh, of what our army is going to do. Okay? Call call Joseph. We we need to to run this by him and get his opinion on it. This was saying that Joseph was very important, that Joseph had a lot of responsibility. Basically, Joseph was the chief of operations in Potiphar's household. And so the question is, how, how does Joseph use this authority? How, how does Joseph use all this responsibility that he has been appointed to? He uses it to bless other people. He uses it to bless Potiphar's house. Again, Potiphar has no concern. He completely trusts Joseph. He doesn't question whether Joseph is responsible or not. He he doesn't have to micromanage and make sure that Joseph doesn't take an extended lunch break. He doesn't look at Joseph's life and say, is he stealing from my house? He completely trusts the character of who Joseph is. And Joseph's work results in Potiphar's house being blessed. And if we, we think back to when God was first speaking to Abraham, and He calls Abraham, and He says, Listen, Abraham, you, you are going to be the father of, of a nation, and you're going to be a blessing to other people. And, and on a small scale, we start to see God doing that here through Joseph's life. Joseph is a blessing and not a burden. Oftentimes in my life and in your life as a Christian, we have this question in our minds of of how can I bless other people or how can I share the gospel with other people. And I'm not going to use the old adage of uh, when necessary, use words. Because listen, It's absolutely necessary to use words. 
I'm going to say that again, guys, because I need to hear that and you need to hear that. At some point, to share the gospel with people is more than just living a good life in front of them. We have to use words. At some point, we're going to have to speak the truth into people's lives and not just be a good example for them to look at. Eventually, words are necessary. But, as we pray, and as we wait, and as we anticipate God to open those opportunities for us to use words, the way we can bless other people is to work for the glory of God. And so we would use our authority and our responsibility to bless others. And so this means that as we go to work, uh, whether you are uh, an employer or whether you're employed, that we live our life with integrity, that we're truthful, that we're trustworthy, and that we take pride in, in what we're doing. Not because we think that we are somebody special. Not because we think we can do it better than somebody else. Not because we want people to look at us and, and pat us on the back and say, you're doing a good job. Again, not because we think we're special, but because we're absolutely convinced that our God is. That should be our motivation when we go to work. That should be our motivation as a husband or a wife. That should be our motivation as somebody's son or daughter. That God is worth it. And that's what Joseph is seeing here. That God is worth it. And you and I must not believe the lie that only ministers are capable of ministry. And I need you to hear that, church, this morning. That don't look to me to be the only person that does ministry. Don't look to your elders to be the only person that does ministry and seeks to bless other people. Because as elders, our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Guess who that is? If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, that's you. You're a saint. We're not waiting for a halo. We're not waiting to be pronounced a saint by the church. If we're in Christ, then Jesus has said you're justified. You are a saint. You're a child of God. And so we are to be about our Father's business. The majority of church growth happens when we are disciples making disciples. That's why that's such a big thing that we will repeat around here. Because it's true. It's true. And I'm not just speaking about numbers. I'm not just saying, hey, if we want more bodies to line the pews, then, then we need, need to be disciples making disciples. I'm talking about spiritual growth. If I want to see success, if I want to gauge success, it is by seeing that the people that we're around, the people in this church, when they're facing suffering, when they're facing trials, when they're facing temptations, when they're facing sin, it's that they go to Jesus and they recognize that they need to, to, to draw closer to God. And that we encourage each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and we continually point to Him. But at your job, uh, at your school, at college, wh whatever you do on a daily basis, guys, you will reach people that we, uh, Scott and Darren and Keith and I, will, will never reach. You'll see people and you'll talk to people that we may never even meet. And you have a, a chance to bless them. Not only by living a life of integrity and trustworthiness and, and letting them see that God has made a difference in your life, but by speaking and sharing the Gospel. And so, one of the things that we need to ask this morning is, is Jesus seen in your actions? Is Jesus heard in your conversations? And are you a blessing or are you a burden? And we keep on going in Genesis 39. It says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he's put me in charge of everything, everything that he has 
in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her her, or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men were in the house, was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I had lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant who you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. And so here is is where most of our minds go when we think of Potiphar's wife. Is this major temptation of a sexual nature. And what we see here is Potiphar's wife uses her authority much differently than Joseph. We see this in contrast, where Joseph seeks to bless other people. Potiphar's wife was trying to get something for herself. And she was a a powerful and wealthy woman. She was used to being catered to. She was used to being obeyed. Nobody questioned her authority. And what would happen is, as her husband had responsibilities with the guard and with the army, there would be times when when she would be left alone. He may be training the guard, or he may have went on a long journey, but there were times when when she would be alone. And what we see here in this story is a a progression. We see her sinful appetites, and, and we see this progression that takes place. And it reminded me of in James chapter 1, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And we can see this in Potiphar's wife. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. This is not just saying Joseph was cute. This is saying that Joseph had that physique that she desired. That Joseph was handsome. That Joseph carried himself and he was confident. It's all these different ways of saying that Joseph was the man. And I was reminded... That uh, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of that UFC fight that we watched a few weeks ago, and I'm not going to do the, the, the uh, McGregor sway, but you, you've seen that strut that he does as he comes in to, to fight matches, and there's this air of confidence that he has that, you know, I'm going into the ring, and I'm the man. And, and we see that she looked at Joseph like that. She, she said he has that physique. He carries himself gracefully. He, he's confident. He, he's all these things that I'm looking for. And then it says, after a time, she cast her eyes on him. Guys, this, this didn't just happen spontaneously. It was a progression. And so Potiphar's wife, as she sees Joseph day after day after day, She'd already slept with him hundreds of times in her mind. She had already fantasized about being with him over and over and over. And she's just trying to make her fantasy into a reality. And so she cast her eyes on him. And it's really an interesting word, uh, the word cast there. In, in, in Hebrew, there's this overtone that she exalted him. That she lifted him up before her. That she, in a sense, enthroned him and said, this is what will satisfy me. This is what right now I am seeking and I am pursuing. Guys, our idols don't bow to us. We bow to our idols every time. 
We put them in a position where we exalt them and then we bow down and and pursue them and chase after them. And we worship and pursue whatever we think will bring us the most joy. But in the end, they, they never satisfy. Our appetite just continues to grow. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, I'm going to paraphrase this. He says, imagine a country where young boys and men plastered their walls with pictures of food. And, and they would spend hours in their rooms looking at these posters and, and going to places to see these pictures of, of, of food. And they would spend time drooling and, and just gazing at pictures of food, you would think that a country like that, they would be starved to death. Imagine a place where people paid money to watch food being slowly unwrapped in front of their eyes. You would think that they had a problem and and they were malnourished, that they didn't have enough food. He says, now imagine the astonishment when you discovered that these people aren't starving at all. That they're gluttonous, that they splurge and they feast and they fill their bellies, but they're never full. Their appetite, you would say, is out of control. And that's what we're seeing here with Potiphar's wife. That she has this desire and it's built and built and built and she's constantly focused on who Joseph is and wanting to be with him. And so she approaches him. And it's interesting how Joseph resists that temptation here. The first thing he does is he identifies this as as sinful. He says, how can I do this wickedness? He says, this is sin. Why is that? It's because she has a disordered desire. Earlier when we were in Genesis uh, several months ago, we said there's nothing wrong with sexual intimacy. Guys, it's, it's a good gift from God for the covenant of marriage. But Joseph notices, notices that it's a disordered desire. And so my Wednesday night crowd, we're going to go through something here. We, we've been talking about how God reveals and explains and interprets. God says in Genesis, let, our, let us make man in our own image. So He's revealing what He's doing. And he says, in the image of God, he made them male and female. He's explaining what he's doing. And then he interprets what he's done and says, therefore, the two became one flesh. And Joseph recognizes that. And he says, listen, this is a sin because you're not my wife. This is a sin because this is outside of what God has ordained and designed and purposed in the marriage covenant. Potiphar's wife wanted satisfaction without sacrifice. Our physical intimacy is designed to reflect mental and emotional intimacy. It's supposed to reflect that union that we have as a husband and wife. And it's designed to show that in a way we say, here is who I am. And and I'm joining with you. My whole self is joining with you. And so, I'm a person and and you're a person. I'm a husband, you're the wife. And and we're becoming one flesh. I give you everything that I am. I don't hold anything back. And you do the same. And that is the covenant of marriage. And and when we think about sexual intimacy, it, it shows that. It illustrates that. And so, when we think about being naked and unashamed, Guys, we're we're not hiding anything in that intimacy. We're saying, here I am. Here is who I am. Not trying to cover anything up. Not trying to hide. And then you can also think about the posture of intimacy. Guys, there's no more uh, a, a posture that is as defenseless as that posture. And we're saying, here, I'm vulnerable Here I am. I I present myself to you. And so outside of God's design of marriage, what we end up saying is, you can have this part of me, but I'm still my own person. I'm still in control. 
I'm not ready to give myself completely to you. I I still have my own life. You have your life, I I have mine. But I, I, I want this part of you. And I'll share this part of myself. And guys, we can see how that's the opposite of what God intends in marriage. That two would become one. That physically, mentally, emotionally, economically, socially, all these different ways, we are becoming one flesh. And so in marriage, we we share struggles. We share joy. We mourn together. We are strengthened by each other. That's God's intent and God's design in marriage. And it's designed to glorify God because it points to Christ and His church. Because we are the bride of Christ. And so we are joined to Christ. And so Joseph says, I I can't do this. I, I can't betray what God has intended and designed. And He won't do it. And so we see that first, He he outright rejects this and says, I desire God's glory more than my own pleasure. You can't make yourself love God more. But guys, we, we need to desire God's glory and fall in love with who He, he is And the way that we do this is by reading His truth and coming to His Word and seeing over and over and being reminded in Scripture about who He is and the promises that He has made in His Word. And then we start to desire Him more and more. Second thing that Joseph does is he safeguards himself. So he starts by just rejecting the offer. But then he starts to put distance between himself and Potiphar's wife. And then finally, he flees. And guys, this is, this is wisdom for any of our disordered desires. First of all, we have to say no, and we have to know why we're saying no. We have to say this is sin, and know why something is sin. And say, I- I'm not going to do that, because it-, it stands contrary to what God's Word has said. And so we confess our sin. And we repent of our sin. And we ask God and and plead with God that He will change our desires. And, and, And instead of desiring things that are fleeting and things that will not satisfy, that He will change our desires to desire Him more. And so practically... If we were to do this, it it might look like this. Whatever your addiction is, whatever your struggle is, it's putting safeguards in place. And and not only going to God and confessing our sin and repenting of our sin and saying, God, I see this is sin. I see that this does not bring you glory. And I want to bring you glory. I, I want to desire you more than anything. It's that. And then it's also saying, I'm not going to put myself in situations that may lead me to compromise what God is convicting me of. I'm going to put distance between me and whatever it is that I know I'm I'm having trouble with. Whatever voice in my head that is, is calling me, I'm going to put distance between me and that. And maybe not only that, but I'm going to surround myself with with friends and a support group where I can be held accountable. And I can say, listen, this is something I'm struggling with. Will you pray with me? This is something I'm struggling with. Will you check on me this week to see how I'm doing with this? This is something I'm struggling with. And right now, I'm really really weak. Would you come over? And, And let's just hang out. So you can help me stay away from this. And guys, that's what we do as a body. That's that's what we're called to do, to to help each other and and encourage each other to godliness. Is to be there for one another. To be there and and support one another. And, and, And listen, not only that, but when we do fail. When we do fail, because it's going to happen. And we go to someone and say, listen, I did it again. I messed up. This is hopeless. I'm never going to change. What's wrong with me? For us to go alongside that person and say, listen, 
and your acceptance is not based on your obedience. It's based on Christ's obedience. And He was perfectly obedient. And He died for you. And He forgives you of that sin too. And that encourages us to to love Him more. You mean He did that for me? Oh, how I love Him. Oh, how I want to be close to Him. Oh, how I want my life to glorify Him. Because He loved me so much that He did that for me. In spite of who I am and in spite of my failures. Guys, that's wisdom for any situation. Whether that be sex, whether that be a, a food problem, whether that be a temper problem, whether that be an alcohol addiction, any of these disordered desires that we might have, that's wisdom. To surround ourselves with people that will continually point us to the cross. The last temptation is the temptation of bitterness. It says, as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. And he showed him steadfast love and he gave him favor inside of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Guys, look at Joseph's life. This this may be the most difficult temptation that any of us face. He is sold into slavery. He's falsely accused and imprisoned. And guys, we haven't seen any gross sin in Joseph's life. I mean, if I look at Joseph's life compared to mine, he's knocking it out of the park. He's doing awesome. But he's imprisoned. He was sold into slavery. How do you respond to God when you... Think that you're, you're doing what He wants you to do, but life is not getting any easier. It's actually getting harder. And the temptation is to say, God, why are you doing this to me? Am I not doing the stuff that you want me to do and, and I'm being punished? And the temptation is to, to be bitter against God. And Joseph in his life, we, we've seen him move from one pit to another pit to another pit. And he just doesn't seem to to get ahead. But the words there were the Lord was with Joseph. And guys, the reason that this story can bring us so much hope is because we see the complete picture. We know where this is going. We, we know that God is going to use Joseph to uh, interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And had he not been put in prison with uh, the baker and the cupbearer of Pharaoh, he would never have the opportunity to interpret those dreams and be able to go to Pharaoh and say, this is the interpretation. And Pharaoh would never have raised him up into the position that he will be able to use to rescue this land from famine. That he would be able to use to to bring his brothers out of famine and preserve this lineage. He would never have been able to do any of that if God had not allowed him to go into the prison. And so this can be a story of hope for us for us because we see that God is with Joseph. But the problem that I have and the problem that you have is we don't have our story. We don't have the full book. And so we don't know and we don't understand what God is doing. But listen, guys. We have the book. I may not have my book. And you may not have your book. But we have the greatest book. 
And if we turn to the end of that book, it says there is coming a day when He will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death and there will be no more sickness and there will be no more suffering and there will be no more depression and there will be no more pain. And He will wipe away every tear and He will restore and rule and reign as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we will look back and say, God, You're good. I see what You brought me from and what You have redeemed me to. And God, You are good. But the problem is we can't see that right now. And so my word of encouragement, guys, this morning is hold on. Hold on. Cling to that. Cling to Him When we look at these temptations, we talked about authority. And we can look in the Gospels and we see Jesus who has all authority. Using His authority to bless. And so He uses that to heal sickness. And He uses that authority to forgive sins. And we see Him lay that aside to die on the cross for our sins. And we see that temptation for intimacy. And guys, if that's something that you're tempted with, if in your heart you have this desire to be known and to be loved, there's nobody that can know you and love you like God can. If you want someone that will give themselves completely to you and hold nothing back. Again, look at the cross. Jesus gave Himself fully and completely because He loves you. And so we can look at God's love. And He knows you. He knows your desires. He knows your hopes. He, he knows your dreams. But guys, he, he also knows our weaknesses. He also knows our failures. And our sins. And He loves us. He gives Himself completely to us. And He does all of this so He can take away our bitterness. And He can bring us peace. And He can bring us hope. And He can bring us joy. Amanda, if you... And uh, Dustin and Adam and Corbin, if you'll come up, we're going to pray. And then we're going to uh, sing and worship Him. Father, I thank You for Your Word. Um, I thank You for Your truth. And God, I don't know what people are going through here this morning, but You have searched all of our hearts. And You know us. God, I don't know what people are struggling with. I don't know uh, what desires that they're chasing that will not satisfy. But God, I, I pray that they will pursue You. I pray that if there are those that are struggling with the temptation of, of sin, no matter what that sin is, that they will desire You more. That they will see You exalted and lifted high. And that they would cast their eyes on you. God, and I pray that you would deliver them. God, that you would, as we're getting ready to sing, make a, a way for them to be delivered. God, we thank you for your blood and we thank you for your sacrifice. You're so good to us. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask these things.